Uh, but we've got something really different today. Uh, no ships or navy. It's all about uh, lawn tennis. Uh, and you would have seen in the bio, Colin lived on Garden Island uh, for many years as a teenager. What a great experience that would be. Lots of interesting things, tunnels, navy. How about the fabulous view? He's an enthusiast archivist, researching and finding lots of interesting information for himself and other members. Uh, you will be convinced by the end of this presentation that the first lawn tennis courts in Australia were definitely on Garden Island. So Colin, over to you. Oh, no, thanks very much. And thanks, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, joining us today on, on this bit of a voyage. Yes, as Noel said, I, I lived on Garden Island. My father worked uh, part in the Navy and then uh, in, involved in refitting his ships. But so this is a story which really came out of um, looking at the, the history of Garden Island and, 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 and just to get everyone in the right uh, mood, first of all, is just you know, it, it's the, uh, uh, I can say it's the third green hill past um, uh, Circular Quay. So you can really see that's where Garden Island is. And, and the tennis courts uh, are, are, are a very central thing to what was happening and has happened on Garden Island for many years. So but let's go back to the starting point. Pre-1788, and if we go back uh, 6,000 years ago, this is what Garden Island looked like. It was two hummocks uh, in the middle of the harbour. Um, it was known as Burrowang. Um, it was a fishing place. Um, and, and it was used by the Aborigines uh, for really 6,000 years as a place to fish. The island, uh, the first uh, uh, Europeans actually were very intrigued by this place, which had... Uh, two hummocks and a, a nice little flat bit of area in the middle. This is uh, uh, the whole of the harbour. Uh, they saw it, uh, it for 40,000 years. And Garden Island only became an island at the end of the last glacial maximus, where the sea level rose uh, about 100 metres, creating uh, Garden Island. And this actually painting is actually of Aborigines sitting on Garden Island looking at Government House. It's, uh, we, have, we have some wonderful uh, historical uh, uh, art. So what did Garden Island look like in plan? Uh, in plan, it, uh, the two hummocks. It's, a, it's probably one of the most surveyed pieces of, of land uh, in Sydney Harbour. And to the south, you can see what was called the fish traps because this was this low shelf in which there were rocks and the Aboriginals uh, used, and it was the women. This photograph taken in uh, 18, uh, about 1870 shows clearly the southern end of the island and shows the, um, this is at low tide. And in 1870, you can see there were, um, Two built well. There's actually four buildings on, on the island. There are two, um, two uh, one a blacksmith shop, uh, a slipway, um, a bit of a sail uh, building up on the on, on the rise, and to the left you can see a building uh, that actually was uh, first put up uh, in 1812 when the island went from being uh, under the governor of the day. So, so Garden Island got its name from, from what it was. It was the place where HMS Sirius, they established the first ship's garden. That was so that they could uh, grow corn and onions to, to prevent, to provide the antiscorbotics that were needed to prevent scurvy. And, and this need to prevent scurvy was, was something that, uh, had gone throughout the whole Royal Navy. And, and of course, we know many stories about Cook and his ideas on uh, lime juice and sauerkraut. So that was the need. And so between the two hummocks uh, was the ideal place for a garden, nice and leveled, um, and probably used by the Aboriginals for 
other purposes. The problem with Garden Island was there's was no permanent water supply, but they did have a couple of tanks. And this uh, uh, plan of 1851 actually shows um, between the hummocks, two what they call tanks. So we think they were cut into the rock and they just uh, run off from the island, went into the tanks. And all this will become apparent as to why I'm talking about uh, the whole the, the garden and the garden issues. So this is a photograph taken about 18, about 1860. Um, and this is where there's the house. Um, if you look to the south, you can just see the remains of, uh, of what was the uh, um, burial places of, of, of two uh, colonial um, um, public servants. Uh, there was a flagstaff. And where the lady's standing is basically this somewhat flattened area uh, of the... Uh, uh, of, of where the garden was established. So keep this in mind, you're, you're looking south, you've got a building and there's a bit of a veranda, uh, there's, a, there's a fence. So um, how did I come to start thinking about the, the lawn tennis? Well, in reading many of the references to tennis on Garden Island, they referred to the first tennis court. And I, and I went, okay, well, let's try and find the first reference in Australia, uh, newspapers or anywhere uh, to lawn tennis. And here it is in the Sydney Mail, 26th of September, 1874. They gave a, an article all about the rules of the game. And that got me really interested as to thinking, well, well who was the person who, who started all this and how did this all come about? Because, and I have to admit, I do not like playing tennis. <laughs> As a kid, it was the one thing that um, I prefer to play squash. Maybe it's, uh, it, it, anyway, I, I never played tennis. So, so this is from a, a purely archival point of view. I then found another reference, Sydney Morning Herald, uh, 1876, uh, just landed, lawn tennis, um, goods you could buy from Mr. Davis in King Street. And there were many other references to uh, tennis in other places. So I went back to have a look at who was the inventor. And here he is, Major Walter Wingfield, who created in 1874, he called it a very spherous strike, ferris stick, or lawn tennis. And he created this game and he actually went into the business of putting it into boxes, a complete set. So Major Walter Clompton Wingfield, inventor of the game, and there's a bust of him in, um, in, at the uh, All England Tennis Courts uh, Museum at Wimbledon. Um, and this was his set. And this is actually the set uh, held at Wim Wimbledon. And, and it's, it's one of the original box sets. So he sold these box sets. Um, and by 1875, I think the number was, he had sold over a thousand of them. So who was he selling them to? Well, this would, before we get to that, maybe this is what it sort of looked like. Um, you had the, you, you got the set, you got the, uh, um, uh, the net, you've got four rackets, uh, you've got some things to knock in the ground to hold the thing upright, and uh, and you followed the basic rules that would set out, because the rules came in the box. And they actually had another set that was called the, the Junior Army and Navy Lawn Tennis. So, so he, he aimed it at the Army and the Navy. And you can see there's a photograph uh, in that photograph there. You can see the diagram of the court and the rules. So you, you got the ball, you got the net, you got the whole thing. And so, um, so it was aimed uh, at, at uh, Army and Navy and, and also the Marines. 
and you can see here the the, the same the setup with the uh, and, and and it's not surprising that uh, um, the the regal touches and if you're a vexillologist you look at the flags and you're thinking well where is that but uh, um, it, it it it's the sort of thing that's played uh, at, at government house and places where uh, uh, aide de camps or naval people would be involved. So here's the redoubtable man himself, uh, um, and uh, at his house, uh, and I, I forget where that was in London, there was one of those famous uh, British blue plates uh, uh, saying, at this place lived Walter Crompton Wingfield, father of lawn tennis. So the question then comes is to, how did lawn tennis come from Wingfield in 1874 to Australia? So in 1874, um, what you've got to look at is, is where were the naval bases, the Royal Navy bases throughout uh, the world? And more importantly, where were the major naval bases and also the coaling stations? So the coalings everywhere where the Navy went, the Royal Navy went, there was either a, a dockyard, a depot, or in some places, a, uh, an officer whose job was, who was the coal inspector. So each one of those dots on that plan is actually a, uh, a coaling site. And, and many of you, you know, but uh, I had 50 years in the coal industry. So, so it, it's a bit close to the heart. So anyway, so look at where the coaling stations were, but also where the major dockyards were. And so the, naval, the major naval depots in 1874, Gibraltar, Bermuda, Malta, Trincomalee, Hong Kong, Sydney. And not surprising, tennis went to each one of these places. So the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines were the people to which Wingfield sold his sets. And this is Bermuda. Um, this is the tennis court in the Admiralty House. And this is Hong Kong, uh, the tennis court at the Naval Depot, uh, HMAS, HM, HMS Tamar. So how did uh, tennis get to Australia? And the strong circumstantial evidence is that Commodore James Graham Goodenough who was appointed the Commodore of the Royal Navy uh, on, the, on the Australia uh, station, uh, the Royal Navy station. He arrived in 1874 and he dies in 1875. Well, Commodore James Goodenough came on the vessel, uh, his ship was HMS Pearl as the flagship. And Trying to find a connection between Good Enough and Wingfield was fairly interesting. And you find out that both of them, uh, uh, both the ship he came on, HMS Pearl, it was a uh, coal fired, uh, it was coal as well as sail. Um, and this is taken in Sydney Harbour. Uh, just to make the point that uh, in 1874, 1875, there were uh, at least three ships that came from UK in that year, 1873-74. And on the Australia station at the state, at that time, there was uh, one, two, three, six. there were 12 ships. I think there's 12 there, there's probably more. At least three of them were built by Cuthberts uh, in Australia. They were actually Australian ships commissioned into the uh, Royal Navy in Australia. But where Good Enough and Wingfield came together was both of them were in China. Um, Good Enough was on the uh, China station and both of them were uh, involved in the Battle of the Tanku Forts. Wingfield uh, obviously in, in the army and Good Enough, uh, as you can see here, uh, this is a depiction of a naval officer leading 
men in the charge, but in fact, uh, he, he was had a, he was involved with a, a, a naval gun ashore. So we've got a circumstantial connection, and we know that from uh, that the first set of um, tennis, uh, lawn tennis, was taken from Bermuda to New York in 1874. So let's come back to look at Garden Island and, and where the tennis court could have been. Back to this, uh, and you can see at the bottom, this photograph was taken in 1877. And we have the house um, just up at the bottom of the, uh, uh, the, the northern uh, the northern hummock. There's the flagstaff, and there's the, the uh, slip, slip, uh, slipways, and the uh, and the two sheds. So that's 1877. Somewhat closer, you can just uh, this is the photographs were too bad, but you can see adjacent to the house, a fairly flat area, which is where the original ship's garden was. And now comes the smoking gun. <laughs> Here is the plan, but it's dated 1880. And you can see, uh, this is, uh, the, look, you can see the house and the yard, lawn tennis ground, shed, grave, blacksmith shop, boat shed, and also the summer house. That's a new addition up on the hill. So here it is, it shows the lawn tennis ground, and this map is 1880. Just another one, just to show it that uh, in, in north south. Uh, and you can see another word reference there is pump. Now, I said before the original 1851 plan, and it had two tanks shown. So it's possible that the pump was used to actually uh, put water onto what was the lawn tennis ground. And so just back again to remind you that there's the, the 1857 photograph and the flattened area. So this photograph is taken a little bit later. Um, there's another shed. Uh, you can see the garden uh, around the back of the house has been extended. Um, uh, there's two, two, uh, there was an encampment there because they were doing a lot of work uh, in uh, trying to establish uh, exact longitude and lat latitude for Sydney. So this plan is, is uh, th this map is taken from a, uh, it's a later map, 18, about 1883. And this was part of the work that was done prior to the, uh, the removing the southern hill. So an extensive amount of, uh, of surveying was done to work out how they were going to build, um, uh, build the, the naval depot. Now the naval depot had been, um, pro been promised by the New South Wales government in about 1875. There had been earlier plans to actually turn this end of Garden Island into a naval cemetery. So here we have again, we can see the, uh, the keeper's house, the veranda, the yard, and of course the lawn tennis ground. Um, a little bit different, uh, the same map and, and uh, the same plan. And you can see um, the reference here to the wall to be set in cement mortar. Now this was all about building uh, the the uh, leveling the hill and and extending the uh, the garden island to the south. So so that's quite quite clear that it's there. So in 1883, uh, the contract was awarded to remove the southern hill and to construct the naval depot. Um, the Sydney contractor was Batty and She, and and in 1885, they had already excavated nearly 47,000 cubic yards of rock, built a seawall, um, as it says there, 2,000 feet long, and consumed 28 
100 cubic yards of concrete. And they built the two cottages um, for the superintendent of the building works. And those cottages built in 1885 is one of them residencies where I lived. And they were built very shoddily. No underfloor um, uh, ventilation, uh, mass, mass uh, sandstone blocks. So if we look at this photograph, this is 1895. And you can see there are two buildings to the south that have been constructed on the reclaimed area. Now they've removed half of the hill. Uh, they have built the, um, the barracks, which is an, almost immediately to the southern end. And quite erroneously in the past, people referred to the uh, tennis court being behind the barracks. Well, of course, it's obviously not. It was somewhere between uh, the middle of the, the southern hill and the northern hill. And you can see the two, uh, the chimneys of the two residences that have been built further up the hill on the northern, on the northern, uh, northern hummock. So this is the northern hummock. Um, this is taken about 1870. And you can see it's uh, pretty scrappy. Uh, it's just, uh, uh, it had a, uh, even at that stage, they had not put the signal mast there. So the signal mast was still uh, convenient in, in the middle. By 1910, with the construction, completion of the removal of the Southern Hill, the construction of the workshop, which is to the right, uh, the boiler with the chimney, the, uh, the main office with the uh, veranda to the left, and to the south is the major stores building. And so the ship's garden and the first lawn tennis is underneath, uh, underneath those two uh, trolleys, which are uh, holding the uh, barrel. Uh, of, of, uh, of one of the ship's guns that has been in for repairs or for re-rifling. And this same photograph taken from the, uh, take a, a photograph of the same place, taken from the stores building, looking to the northern hill, and you can see now this huge signal mast. And the reason it was so large is, is of course, that uh, it was also the radio transmission tower. It's how they communicated to all the ships uh, in the Pacific. So, th so the original tennis court and, and the original garden is of course to the, to the left of what is the, uh, uh, where you can see a bit of a carts and before the hill. So the smoke uh, emitting as you look up the hill on the left is from uh, the residences built for the uh, superintendents, which became officers. Uh, we came houses for the master attendant and uh, others. So this is um, a 1910 plan and, and you can start to see on the hill, they have built the first tennis court. Um, you can see the, uh, the island has been extended. Uh, the Northern Hill is still there. Um, there was some consideration that the Northern Hill should be demolished uh, to extend the uh, coal store. Uh, they, they wanted to increase the coal handling capacity of Garden Island. Um, this is uh, an, another plan and it shows the signal station, uh, the summer house uh, and the tennis court and the, and the pavilion. And to the right, um, uh, apart from far right, which is the garbage, garbage destruction um, uh, incinerator, there are the steps down to the bath. So this was the, uh, this was the uh, sea bath that was created for the benefit of those who lived on the island. So here's the first tennis court on the hill. And these are a series of photographs which show uh, here is the pavilion and, uh, and here is the tennis court that has actually been uh, doubled in size. So you've got two courts. And, and there is, uh, to the left, uh, there is a Norfolk Island pine, um, quite young. 
it, it, it is simp uh, that's 1910. Um, it, it, I think, has actually, yes, it was, it was removed only two years ago. Here we can see the pavilion, uh, and on the hill is the signal station. Um, the pavilion uh, exists today exactly as it is and has been repaired uh, and looks very much as it was in 1910. The tennis, the tennis group, the ladies uh, suitably attired, gentlemen with ties on, <laughs> and, and there's the pavilion itself. Uh, here we have actually bow tie and, and the ladies with ties. For, if, if, if you understand uh, folkology, that's the study of ties. Um, it's quite interesting to see ladies with ties on it. Japanese, uh, we have, uh, it was quite, uh, the tennis courts were a significant place to actually have Japanese visitors uh, and the Japanese fleet uh, visited uh, from really the early 1900s onwards. Um, and of course, uh, our, the most recent was a, a Japanese uh, ship that came with the with two other uh, described allies who arrived in Sydney, but unfortunately they were, were not allowed ashore. Uh, but these gentlemen uh, uh, took great pride, I think, in being photographed, but probably not so happy of being photographed with women. Typical. So the, the look on the face of these Japanese gentlemen is not one of pleasure. Uh, you can see in the background uh, Fort Denison, and just uh, uh, there is a ship going by. Um, so uh, the 1930, uh, 1930s, uh, the tennis court uh, is now in its current position, doubled in size. Uh, this is all the walkways. Uh, this is before the main signal station went in in 1923. Um, and you can see the residences uh, um, and, and the, the tenants courts and the baths were for the, for the use of the residences first. Um, Lord Jellicoe in 1919, when he came to Australia to review uh, the naval establishments, uh, um, uh, him playing on Garden Island. So in 1930, uh, uh, Garden Island, uh, you can see the tennis courts quite plainly on the, uh, on the northern hill. Uh, some of the, uh, a bit closer and closer. <laughs> but it's very interesting that, the, uh, that when they placed the, uh, uh, the oil tank, um, and, and you can see the oil tank there uh, back in 1917, there was great debate as to where it should be located. And, and the two trees, uh, one planted uh, by uh, uh, the opening of parliament in 1901, who, who later become King George V, um, they had to, to uh, avoid the, uh, at one stage they wanted to put the uh, oil tank where the uh, tennis court mother, and now that was never going to happen. So, um, so the oil tank uh, uh, was located to avoid the King's Tree and the Tennis Court. So another photograph, uh, the 1930s, and, and for those who are interested, you can see uh, quite clearly how the, the, the seawall that was uh, the 2,800 cubic yards of concrete that went into building that seawall, um, and then the, uh, the Southern Hill being filled in. Um, uh, HMS, uh, it, it became HMS Penguin, um, what's a, it's a wonderful photograph to show the, the, the shear leg um, and, uh, and, and, and what was then seen to be a very nice, uh, a nice location. And everyone commented that to, they liked seeing things happening on Garden Island. Unfortunately, the neighbours weren't too happy, especially those at Potts Point when uh, the, uh, the dock was put in. Uh, Captain Cook Graving Dock was, was established. Um, this photograph uh, is from March 1946. And this is my father's ship, HMS Implacable, uh, entering the dock. Um, 
it's in, in quite sometimes it's referred to as the, the the docking of HMS Illustrious, but of course that was a year a, a year earlier. So this is one year later after the opening of the dock. So we have the courts on the hill, and uh, um, and they have remained uh, where they are. Um, one of their famous uh, advocates of tennis for the Royal Navy was. Uh, Sir Henry Burrell, who I knew quite well. And this is the uh, Royal Australian Navy tennis, and they play for the Burrell Cup. Um, the Garden Island uh, uh, Social and Sporting Club also uh, had a tennis trophy for annual competition. Um, and, and you can see that the tennis courts uh, are a part of, uh, of what is a significant uh, part of uh, Garden Island, which, which is the Naval Garden. Uh, this is part of a plan to, which identifies the major trees, which will be part of a long-term uh, land conservation uh, management plan. So recently the tennis courts were upgraded with new lighting, um, with uh, a new surface, and so the tennis courts itself uh, 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 have a, had beautiful views once uh, uh, where you could actually look out onto the uh, onto Sydney Harbour. But the, the, the significant growth of, uh, uh, and some of its secondary growth, has completely removed a lot of the wonderful vistas. And so the aim uh, of part of uh, our agitation for a long-term conservation plan is to return some of the vistas. There's the pavilion, pretty much as it is today, and as it was in 1910. Uh, admittedly, uh, the roof uh, a little bit different. The, the, uh, the, the courts are in what is, um, one of the significant gardens uh, of Sydney. Uh, there are 15 trees within, within the garden, which are on the significant tree register for um, the, the city, uh, the Sydney City Council. So it's quite a unique uh, situation. Sydney City Council registers the trees on the island um, as being significant. Um, garden Island, uh, the northern end, including the is within the um, um, uh, within the area of the uh, Sydney Opera House and its uh, World UNESCO listing. Um, so the the tennis courts remain part of that uh, long term uh, view of of what Garden Island is. It, it provides an opportunity for people to uh, play on it, although. I don't know to what extent people are using it of recent times. So 2024, it will be 150 years. So how do we how do we celebrate it? So okay, maybe an exhibition tennis match uh, held in the old uh, uh, right on top of where it was. Admittedly, it's uh, three meters lower than it would have been. But probably even better, why not uh, um, having the Royal Australian Navy play the Royal Navy at Wimbledon? Because at Wimbledon, um, for, for nearly uh, 70 years, the Navy and the Marines have provided most of the, uh, a lot of the volunteers. And recently, uh, the uh, Army as well, and Air Force and London Fire Brigade have provided the uh, People to support um, uh, the support uh, volunteers for Wimbledon. So, um, so Garden Island, uh, uh, there's uh, the wonderful view from the signal station, uh, the tennis courts uh, to the north and to the west. Uh, um, you can see the two trees planted, uh, the tree planted by the king, as well as in the opera house and the Sydney Harbour, um, Sydney Harbour Bridge in the background. So thank you. Um, I, I, I 
hope that you would all be have an interest to actually come and visit uh, uh, the hill when, when once again it's open to the public and uh, um, and, I, and also, once again, the society will, will run tours of the hill. And in preparing this, I'd like to, to thank all the volunteers um, who've, who've helped me uh, uh, in, in putting this together, and, and all those volunteers of the past who actually accumulated the information, uh, which enabled me to uh, uh, dig into it to present this to you today. So thanks very much. Colin, can I ask a couple of questions? Go for it. Um, I'm David Campbell. I was the Naval Support Commander 25 years ago and had some problems with the tennis court. The, <laughs> <laughs> so much so that ADI, who owned the, uh, the dockyard at the time, wanted to cease maintaining it because it was hardly ever used. It was hardly ever used because access was made very difficult. I remember Pam Leach, wife of the former CNS Leach, used to come with a bunch of ladies once a week, but they were really, I'm not talking now 96, 1996, but Pam and her friends were, as far as I know, the only users of the court in those days. Little wonder ADI wondered about having to um, maintain the place. So the deal that I struck with ADI was to take up the grass and put AstroTurf on it. Yep. That was 96. Um, that was a very unpopular decision with the ladies, but it was either AstroTurf or nothing. It was pretty sad. But um, I fascinate, was fascinated with your presentation this morning. Thank you very, very much. I learned a lot. <laughs> The, um, oh, incidentally, the, the signal uh, mast there um, is at the National Maritime Museum now. Yeah. Some, somewhat cut down in size, but at least it survived. Yeah. Thank you very much. No, well, thank, th thanks, David, for your contribution. And, and, and one of the real stories about uh, the garden is, it's, yes, it's being maintained at the moment, but there's so, it's so restricted access Yes. Um, it, it's even for us to get there because of all the construction that's going on. Um, that's not possible. Uh, one thing I did forget to mention is, of course, when they put the tunnels underneath, the shaft that goes down to the uh, to where the emergency generator station is, it it had to miss the tennis courts as well. <laughs> so there's, there was even even in 19, um, 1940. Uh, 41, 42, when they put that shaft in, they actually had to miss the tennis court. So it's actually behind the, uh, um, it's actually behind the pavilion. Um, so yes, yeah, so there's, there's, it's, it, 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 it's, it's been, a, I think, a, a problem for many people, but it's an asset and it's got a history, which I think um, hopefully this uh, underpins why um, someone should always uh, keep reminding people that it, it's of a historical interest yeah. and, and, and national significance. Colin, so, you mentioned the fact that some of those trees are heritage listed. I presume, and I hope, that the courts too enjoy some uh, ah, heritage listing. Well, this is one of the one of the, the key points of that uh, we are the heritage. There is a heritage listing under Commonwealth heritage, but um, what, what we're really hoping to do is to get national heritage listing. And because it's within the Opera House uh, catchment area for world heritage and, and the three, and I refer to the three green hills, um, it is seen to be a significant part of that. Um, but we, we um, I started the process um, and, uh, and and that's been part of building up this historical uh, and archival support to actually make an application for national heritage. So uh, have you got the support of the New South Wales Environment and Heritage Office? Um, yeah, we've got it's under state heritage. So we've we've got City of Sydney, state, Commonwealth. We just haven't got national. And, and so so. Ah, well, there's 
th th there's a process to go. And, sure. uh, oh, good uh, luck. It's well, really it, it's like everything, it just takes time. Yeah. <laughs> what I didn't show, we, 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 we discovered there are many photographs of ladies groups having tennis parties on Garden Island, uh, especially after the Second World War. The, the War Widows Guild um, used to play there quite often. And uh, so, and there was um, quite a lot of tennis that was played. And when I was a, uh, a kid on Garden Island, uh, there was always people with tennis parties because uh, it was very simple uh, to get access. And, and sometimes there was competition to you know, have a party there. And, um, and the pavilion was a great spot to actually have, uh, um, have, have a bit of a, uh, have a party anyway and uh, New Year's Eve uh, uh, the pavilion if it was wet it, there's an awful lot of people you could fit in the pavilion when it was a wet night on New Year's Eve. I think we might uh, end on that note what an outstanding uh, piece of research congratulations Colin I also uh, learned a lot and what wonderful photos uh, and it uh, was really a trip uh, down uh, memory lane history. Uh, Thank <laughs> you.